Hey, also, before we begin, I just wanted to give you a spoiler warning. This video essay contains major spoilers for The Eye of the World, aka The Wheel of Time, book one, and potentially the first season of Amazon Prime's Wheel of Time adaptation. If you have not read the book and want to remain unspoiled in regards to the novel or the show, I would recommend skipping this video for now. You have been warned. Rereading The Wheel of Time is always a treat. As a self-avowed Wheel of Time fan, I relish every opportunity to firmly dive back into this 15-book mammoth of a fantasy series. The grand world, the nuanced characters, and the epic conflict between good and evil are so fleshed out with detail that even the most fantastical elements feel believable. And even though I've read these books numerous times before, escaping to this universe of lovable heroes, detestable villains, awe-inspiring magic, and fearsome monsters is an absolute blast. And now with the premiere of Amazon Prime's Wheel of Time adaptation in just a few months, I figured now was a good time as ever to dive back into the series that I love so much. I believed that now was the right time to start rereading the series and re-experience this epic adventure. It is the right time. Of course, rereads of the Wheel of Time hit differently than experiencing it for the first time. In fact, reliving the Wheel of Time over again grants a sense of perspective over the creative choices made by the Wheel of Time's author, Robert Jordan no relation. See, reading through the Wheel of Time a second or a third time means that the newness of the series has worn off. No longer shocked by plot twists and surprises, the reader becomes aware of the narrative layering and structure. In fact, the reader ponders many questions. Questions like, why did Jordan introduce this specific plot element at this specific moment? Why do we follow this specific character rather than this specific character? How did the prior scene lead into this specific sequence? And all of these questions and so many more are pieces to a a bigger conundrum. The big question being, what makes the Wheel of Time tick? And to even start formulating an answer, let's take a spoilerific dive into the first Wheel of Time novel, The Eye of the World. To start, The Eye of the World eases the reader into the Wheel of Time's exemplary fantasy setting. From the first hundred pages alone, we learn that the Wheel of Time's young main characters, consisting of Rand Al Thor, Matt Cawthon, Perrin Ibarra, Egwene Alvir, and Nene Valmira, fell in Eamon's Field, a farming backwater that's so far in the middle of nowhere that the middle of nowhere considers it to be the middle of nowhere nowhere, kind of like a fantasy version of Nebraska. And from there, they lived normal lives. But on one fateful night, the characters' peaceful lives are thrown into disarray when Trollocs, i.e. monstrous minions of the evil Dark One, attack Eamon's field. In the attack, the Trollocs burned, pillaged, and murdered whatever and whoever they could. And there was a lot of property damage and there were some casualties. However, with that being said, the Trollocs targeted Eamon's field with a specific goal in mind. According to a visiting magic-wielding Aes Sedai, named Moraine and her bodyguard in the Warder land, the Trollocs were seeking Rand, Matt, and Perrin for mysterious yet nefarious reasons. And due to this, the three boys of Eamon's Field flee their homes by joining a travel party with Moraine, Land, the mayor's daughter, Egwene Alvir, the village wisdom Nene Valmira, though she technically joins the party later than everyone else at Bear and a traveling gleeman, i.e. a bard, named Tom Marilyn. And from there, the party's goal is to seek refuge at the Aes Sedai stronghold of Tar Balan. And once there, the young men and women of Eamon's Field hope to find answers as to why their home was attacked. As you can see, there's quite a lot going on narratively here. But the Eye of the World is easy enough to understand when you keep in mind that the book takes many world-building cues from J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, particularly when discussing the Hobbits. In terms of the Hobbits, Hobbits in the Lord of the Rings, most of them haven't left their homes in the Shire or traveled the realms that they reside in. And just like the Hobbits, the Wheel of Time's main crew aren't very worldly either. Ignorant of the realm's customs or even what kingdom they reside in, Rand, Matt, Perrin, Egwene, and Nenave aren't familiar with much aside from their small villages and the town's farming countryside aesthetic. And like the Hobbits in the Lord of the Rings, many of the Eamon's Fielders' beliefs are proven incorrect over the course of the novels. And due to their lack of knowledge, they have a lot to learn about the realm they reside in. This characterization works as a clever storytelling device. By being young and experienced characters who have never left Eamon's field, our heroes always have questions. Fielding their queries to the wise 
Moraine, the hardened Lan, or the knowledgeable Tom Marilyn, protagonists like Rand and Egwene ask questions about the nations of the Earth, the world's various factions, and how Aes Sedai channel the One Power. It's a lot of questions, especially because these are country bumpkins with minimal knowledge of the world. But over time, the Eye of the World slowly but surely reveals the answers. Sure, some of the characters like Moraine are purposefully withholding information from the Eamon's Field 5, but she and the rest of the more worldly characters like Lan and Tom answer questions asked by their younger and more inexperienced counterparts. And through Moraine, Lan, and Tom, the younger characters do receive some context as to what is going on more is revealed to them. This is important from the reader's perspective. Seeing as the Eamon's fielders are inquisitive, their questions echo the thoughts of new readers who are trying to understand the Wheel of Time's world for the first time. See, Rand and company are asking questions that the reader would ask if they were in their shoes. Whether regarding the world, the plots, or the world's factions, the reader and the characters have the same questions, and by answering, Moraine, Lan, and Tom aren't just informing the characters, but they are actually informing the readers as as well. It is simultaneous exposition. A great example of this occurs earlier in the book in the chapter titled A Place of Safety. See, after the attack on Eamon's Field, both the reader and Rand are introduced to Trollocs and other vile monstrosities. But even after all the drama, Rand, and by extension the reader, are still in the dark on certain specifics. And due to this, Rand asks some questions in order to clarify the action for both himself and the reader. He asks Moraine about the creepy cloaked horseman called Fate, ravens that serve the Dark One, and why he, Matt, and Perrin must leave Eamon's Field. And while Moraine doesn't reveal every single detail, she does explain enough to keep Rand and the reader informed of the plot, the events of the narrative, and the world as a whole. In other words, Rand's questions and Moraine's explanations keep both the reader and Rand in the loop. The Eamon's Fielder's naivete serves another purpose as well. Seeing as Rand, Matt, Perrin, Egwene, and Inave are country hicks who don't understand the ways of the realm, the reader can connect with them. After all, new readers aren't familiar with the Wheel of Time's world either, and the inquiries posed by Rand, Matt, Perrin, Inave, and Egwene all allow the story to explain itself through natural dialogue, which is something that we the readers are thankful for. After all, we the readers relate and identify with the Eamon's Fielders because we understand their confusion. Seeing as the Wheel of Time is a deep and detail-rich fantasy world, the reader only knows as much about the world as these inexperienced characters, and because of this the protagonists are immediately relatable. We understand their confusion to the workings of the world because we are confused ourselves and are awaiting explanations. It just fits. Furthermore, the Eye of the World introduces new plot elements in short spurts. Aside from a dramatic introduction, roughly the first hundred pages only contain the POV of Rand, and from his perspective, we slowly but surely meet his friends, family, and acquaintances, all characters who introduce and explain new lore details. In fact, each new chapter features a new character explaining different aspects of the world, whether it is the secretive Moraine, the rumor-mongering peddler Pat and Fane, or the dramatic storyteller Tom, each character reveals a fresh narrative wrinkle to spice up the proceedings, and if anything, many ideas are planted like seeds. And through the new character interactions, we learn about important lore details. For a few examples, we learn that false dragons are dangerous and can figuratively turn the world upside down, we are clued into the fact that the Two Rivers was once the location of the lost nation of Manathrene, and we learn that men who can channel the One Power are doomed to go insane. Regardless, though, these narrative points, and so many more, are important and have major ramifications in the series, and over time these story elements blossom and branch out as more details are revealed, especially around midway through the Eye of the World, where many lore components that were placed in the story earlier begin to play out in action. A notable example of this is how early on we, the reader, are introduced to concepts revolving around the Dragon Reborn, i.e. the one prophesized to either save or destroy the world, the instances of false dragons, i.e. people who claim to be the Dragon Reborn but are not and the dangers of men that can channel, i.e. men who are destined to go insane because the male half of the source, Sidin, was corrupted by the Dark One. And from there, we the leader learn about these ideas and concepts as well as people's reactions to them. Reactions that are negative seeing as people are notably terrified of the concept of the Dragon Reborn, false dragons, and men that can channel. And through the reactions of regular people, we the reader realize that these concepts are dangerous, terrifying, and aren't something that people within the Wheel of Time's world should talk about lightly. They 
they have heft. These concepts, as well as people's reactions to them within the narrative, are critical to the story. After all, we eventually learn that the main protagonist, Rand, can channel the One Power, and by the end of the story, it is revealed that he is actually the Dragon Reborn, the very person who causes the average dude to shiver in their own boots. It's a big deal. And with the early descriptions of concepts revolving around the Dragon Reborn and men that can channel, as well as people's fear of them, this delivers some critical narrative and thematic weight when we learn that our sympathetic hero Rand is the one destined to either save or destroy the world, go insane, and potentially become a figurative monster. And because the scary notions of men who can channel and the Dragon Reborn are introduced so early into the story, the later narrative points involving Rand hit home they land. The lore details and narrative wrinkles placed in the middle of the book pay big dividends later on in the story as well. Like the earlier plot elements introduced at the beginning of the book, there are numerous of other instances later on in the Eye of the World where a new concept or idea was depthfully introduced, all to the point of feeling organic. An example of this can be seen in the middle of the book when Moraine explains to Nenev that magic channelers become sick after channeling the One Power in a major way for the first time. And and by a major way, I mean like curing someone of a severe illness or calling forth a strike of lightning, more so than something more trivial like refilling a horse's stamina. But regardless, this becomes an important world-building detail as the eye of the world goes on. Sure, this might seem like a throwaway lore description at first, but it comes into play later on in the novel when the character of Rand becomes ill after channeling the One Power in a noteworthy way for the first time, just as Nanave and the reader were informed of in an earlier chapter. This is impressive from a storytelling standpoint. See, the Eye of the World doesn't explicitly state that Rand can channel the One Power until the end of the book, but there are plenty of contextual clues earlier on in the book that allude to how he actually can channel Sidin, and one of these clues is the fact that he becomes sick after channeling the One Power in a major way for the first time, just as Moraine said happens. And when Rand inadvertently uses his power to draw a strike of lightning, he does become ill a few days later, and while the book never explicitly states that Rand channeled the One Power here and got ill as a result of it, the Eye of the World framed the exposition, action, and the narrative in such a way that it didn't need to be said. Because of Moraine's earlier explanation, it was obvious. Another great example of the Eye of the World's terrific world building revolves around Rand's arrival in Camelin and his nature as a tavern. When resting at an inn known as the Queen's Blessing, Rand meets no gear, an incredibly tall and knowledgeable magical creature with an infinity for books and nature. The Ogier, named Loyal, explains that Rand is possibly Tavern, a person who is destined by fate to change the world. For Tavern, the impossible becomes possible and coincidental happenstance becomes a regular occurrence, kind of like a fantasy version of Houdini. For Tavern, once seemingly far-fetched scenarios are more likely to occur. Events feel fated. A good example of Rand being Tavern occurs a few scenes after Loyal's explanation. In this scene, Rand infiltrates the Queen of Andor's palace by complete accident, long story. And he meets the daughter heir Elaine Tracken, who is a future love interest, Andor's ruler and Queen Morgesi, and the Queen's Aes Sedai advisor Elaida, who is a future adversary. And between the introductions of new characters and the notable bit of world building, the sequence might have seemed outlandish if it occurred earlier in the Eye of the World, prior to the description of Tavurin. I mean, let's be honest here. Our country bumpkin of a lead protagonist just so happens to infiltrate the royal palace without realizing it. He just so happens to meet and befriend the daughter heir of Andor, he coincidentally speaks with the Queen of Andor, and he accidentally runs afoul of the Queen's Aes Sedai advisor Elaida, who later becomes a big antagonist in the series? That is a lot to occur in one scene, and if it happened earlier in the Eye of the World, the sequence might have seemed like far-fetched happenstance. But after Loyal firmly explained the concept of Tavern to both Rand and the reader, the situation, as preposterous as it sounds, actually has an in-narrative justification. It has an in narrative reason as to how to burn work. And as a result, the reader does not question the logistics of the scene. It makes sense. The Eye of the World's character development operates in a similar manner. In terms of character building, the book plants many core characteristics of these characters early on so that they can blossom later on. For a few examples, Nenev, noted for her tenacity, tracks down the fleeing Emmons fielders and scolds them for even considering to leave her out of the adventure. Perrin, a burly man who is considered slow-witted, is later revealed to be very 
very intelligent and a thoughtful decision maker. Matt, established as a prankster and a troublemaker, makes an ill-advised decision to explore the cursed evil city of Shatter Logoth, and Rand shows off some of his sight-in channeling capabilities in the book's climax. Truly, there is a lot going on in terms of character development, but regardless of character though, much of the Eye of the World's purpose is to build a strong foundation for the Wheel of Time as a big epic high fantasy series. And with that, the Eye of the World succeeds with flying colors. Whether we are discussing character development, the lore, or prominent narrative events, new ideas are constantly introduced in the Eye of the World at regular intervals, all while being explained well and naturally through the dialogue and exposition. And through all this, the reader simultaneously feels intrigued about the world, all while being rewarded with new understandable information that helps the Wheel of Time's world grow authentically in the reader's imagination. Which is a very hard line for a book to walk, but the Eye of the World does an admirable job. By the end, the Eye of the World's most notable feature is how it sets up the Wheel of Time's world and characters. Unlike other fantasy series like Malazan Book of the Fallen, the Wheel of Time eases the reader into its world by utilizing a standard fantasy template, one that allows the reader to become grounded in the world, before adding more nuanced layers to the story, world, and characters as the book goes on. It is a fascinating foundational piece of world building. While I didn't exactly fall in love with the Wheel of Time until the more action-driven second book, The Great Hunt, the Eye of the World did establish a great interesting world of heroes, villains, queens, fantastical creatures, and magic that has occupied my imagination since the first time I read it. And honestly, there aren't many books that have done that, and rereading The Eye of the World for the third time was just as good as the first and second time that I experienced it. It is one of a kind. See ya. And with that, that was the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a like rating and subscribe to my channel. Ring the bell so that you're notified for whenever I drop another video. Also, leave a comment telling me what you think about the Eye of the World and the Wheel of Time in general. Additionally, please check out my Patreon page. The link is in the description. And speaking of Patreon, I just want to thank my patrons, especially my high tier ones, and David, Samantha, Devlin, Mom, and Morgan. Thank you so much for supporting what I do. Love y'all.